Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. The odds are that you, a Bullseye listener, know David Cross. Alongside Bob Odenkirk, he created and starred in the brilliant and influential sketch series Mr. Show on HBO. He's a longtime stand-up comic. And of course, there's Arrested Development. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the theater. I am Dr. Tobias Funke, and I will be your new director. So there's that David Cross, the funny guy. But more recently, David has started branching out. He's starring in this new movie called The Dark Divide. In it, he plays a fictionalized version of Robert Pyle, a real-life science writer and expert in moths and butterflies. In the film, Robert is at a crossroads in his life. He's just lost his wife to a long battle with cancer. He's rudderless. He doesn't really know what to do with himself. And he finds out that before she passed, his wife applied for a grant for him. He finds this out when he gets the grant approval letter. And apparently, the plan is for him to pack his car with butterfly catching stuff, get together some hiking gear, and head to a giant forest in Washington state. There, Pyle embarks on a six-week-long trek through the woods, ostensibly to find and research new butterfly species. It's a beautiful, quiet film. It bounces back and forth between his time in the forest and the last days he spent with his wife. And Cross loses himself in the part. You can see the sadness and exhilaration. Sometimes you feel it too. And since it's David Cross, it's still very funny. Like in this scene from early in the film. Here, Robert is on his way to the trailhead. He stopped at a local convenience store to get a few last minute supplies. And he strikes up a conversation with the clerk, played by Cameron Esposito. Let's listen. Where are you hiking to? I'm going from Highway 12 over Mount Adams to the Columbia Gorge. On foot? Yep. Jesus. How long does something like that take? Well, I'm anticipating uh, up to a month. Didn't the Petrus brothers do something like that back in 88? <laughs> yeah, they sure did. They got their asses kicked. Well, it's... Yeah, he's right. I mean, you should not do this right now. That trail's no joke. The bears have slept off along. They're going to be extra hungry. Uh, I think I'll be I'll be fine. Thank you, though. I've, I've done several overnights in the field, so. <laughs> overnights. Overnights. Perhaps I should get another bag of peanuts. For the, it's a long trip. David Cross, welcome back to Bullseye. I'm so happy to have you back on the show. Thank you, Jesse. Happy to be here. So... You've acted in almost every kind of thing at this point in your career, but I still imagine it must have been a little scary to undertake a film where, you know, 70% of the time you're the only person on screen. I'm in, I'm in my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of underpants. Yeah. It is an <laughs> underpants heavy film. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's... Uh... I didn't think about that so much when I was, uh, when I was doing it or, you know, thinking about doing it and meeting with the director, it was, uh, um, but once we started shooting, it became much more apparent how much would be, I'd be on my own. And I, the scene that you just played a, a, a clip from is happens early on in the movie, but that was one of the last scenes we shot. And I, was so excited and after being in the woods for almost a month like the idea of actually having a conversation or riffing with a human being uh and we did a lot of that we had to cut that way down but um and i know cameron from uh stand up and uh you know it was like a guy in isolation who's who can't shut up. it was like that scene in um in breaking bad where walter white pays the guy like a million bucks to play you know cards with him for an hour just so we could talk to somebody that's how i felt and it, it, it did become apparent as we were shooting, but uh, but it wasn't like I was in isolation because there was a crew and all that stuff. And um, but yeah, it was interesting, that's for sure. 
the movie largely takes place in nature, almost exclusively takes place mm-hmm. in nature, in, in the place that it's about. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it like to go out with what I imagine wasn't a huge crew? Oh, no, shoot. To- total skeleton crew. Because a lot of where we shot, I mean, I'd say over half of the nature stuff was in in the woods off of a accessible road. So we would have to drive to in, to a point where you couldn't drive any further and then lug gear in, uh, you know, anywhere from a quarter of a mile to a mile in, deep in there. You know, there's no electricity or internet or any of that stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, it was skeleton crew for most of the time, at least in those in those in that part of the movie, the, the in the woods part. Was it a part of the country that you'd ever been to before? Not, not really. I, there were, you know, three or four times uh, when I'd go up to do bumper shoot in Seattle, or I'd be doing something in Portland. Occasionally, I have a number of friends who live in Seattle and Portland, and uh, we'd kind of go on a a day drive and into the woods and hike around for a couple hours, but nothing like that. And it, it's nothing I've ever experienced. It, it, I've been in the woods plenty of times but mostly in the east coast uh northeast and southeast and it's it's quite different the the woods up there is is it's bigger the trees are larger it's lusher it's thicker it's more dense it's um you sense the mythology uh that that has been created from those type of woods it's um and you feel small physically you feel small in those woods and uh, I've, I've never really experienced that. I remember roughly 20-something years ago, maybe 25 years ago, I went um, on a hike through the Redwoods in Northern California. And that's the closest I've ever been to that kind of thing. But that was, again, that was for a couple hours, you know, during a day on a drive cross country and not to the extent that we were doing it there. And it's it's really stunning and beautiful and and just magical there's a really intense sequence in the film where you hurt yourself and you know you sort of sort of get overwhelmed and lose the thread your character does um was it easy to get to that place on camera um are you talking about the scene in the lava tubes yeah that's what i was thinking of I was so, uh, first of all, that, um, as crazy as that looks, it doesn't even do it justice for how intense that, that place is. Uh, and I, I'd been told about this too, numerous times by the director and the location guy, like, this is the cool, when do you see this? Check this out. It's nuts. I, I wasn't expecting it to be as, as crazy as they said. Um, they did do it justice. The experience of going to this A-frame house, which is just, it's small, but it's in the middle of nowhere. You drive for, you know, close to an hour to get there. And, uh, um, and it's very normal. There's a little kind of fifties looking small kitchen type of place. And there's a, a little, there's a comfortable chair with a TV on the corner. And it's just a small little A-frame in the middle of the woods in the middle of nowhere. And then there's a door. And just a very normal seeming door. And you open it and it is like the the immediate oppression was like the lair of a Bond villain where it's very unassuming from the outside. And it's like, oh, here's a rock. And you move the rock and then it, it, you descend uh, maybe 50 yards down like this industrial strength, diamond plated, uh, you know, those like steel uh, stairwells that are, um, and you have to hook yourself up, but you have a security, you have a belt and you wear the belt and the belt hooks to this thing. And you have these hat, miners hats, you know, with the lights on and you go a long way down and it's pitch black. When you open the door, say it's whatever it is, say it's, uh, 75 degrees and you open the door and you can already feel it's about 45 degrees and wet. And then you go down into this thing a long, 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 long way down. And you are in the, bottom of a lava tube uh which really exists and and is from who knows 100 million years ago i'm not sure and um and there's no light there's no ventilation um there's less oxygen there's uh it's wet all that stuff you see 
uh, the particles in the air, that's all real. Uh, there's no effects of any of that stuff. Um, and, and it's cold and it's wet and, uh, the floor is, uh, sharp lava and, um, and jagged and everything. And so to, to answer your question, by the time that we got to that point of shooting it, it was so, I was so exhausted and, and mentally weirded out. It was a very, very difficult shoot physically the most grueling thing I've ever done, you know, uh, shoot wise. And, uh, and to be down there all day and there's no light, there's no, no amenities and, uh, and trying to get in as much as we could get in, in, the, in a day with no sense of time or anything. It was a very strange experience. So that helped me get to that place. Cause I was pretty beaten up by then. It was towards the end of the shoot. And I was uh, I physically in pain, and it was kind of a uh, miserable situation, <laughs> but we were all in. And I think if we had shot that in the first two weeks, I don't know if I would have gotten there, but by the time we shot at that scene at that at the end of the day of that type of day of the prior three weeks, it was it helped me to get to that place. It's a movie about a man who loses his wife. Did it? And you're a married man and a and a father. Did you find yourself thinking about what it would be like to lose your life partner? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that was really one of the things, probably the only thing, you know, that I had uh, that I was thinking about. I was thinking about. Amber and I was thinking about my daughter and I was thinking about would I ever see them again? And, um, and the idea of trying to verbally shout out and, and express this connection to them. Uh, and, and the, the, you know, the real life woman in the film, the wife of the guy I play was, again, this is all based on a real story. Tia, like I, I, I said the word Tia, but I was thinking of, you know, my family. It's a hard thing to think about. Yeah. And I, again, I, it's, I, I can't um, impress upon you enough that how emotionally fragile I was by the time we were shooting that scene. I mean, we still had another probably week and a half to go, I think, but uh, and the first week was pretty easy. First week's shooting was, you know, was the, the, the stuff with Deborah, you know, the flashbacks with my wife and then, um, all the flashback stuff and, um, the stuff on the, you know, where I'm like driving up to the woods and getting ready to go. That was all the first week. So it was relatively easy. Um, but by the time we got there, it was, I mean, it, it this thing beat the out of me and I, I also hadn't seen my wife and daughter um that was the longest the first time i ever had a long stretch where i didn't see uh, my daughter for a long time and um yeah again i i don't i don't mean to sound i'm hearing myself and i sound very i sound like one of those actors who you know prattle on and on about that kind of stuff and it gets a little annoying but it was uh it really was the hardest thing i've done for sure you know, I I've followed your career for a really long time, and I feel like I don't know very much about your childhood and adolescence. Other than that, you know, you lived mostly in Georgia, and it was a little weird to be Jewish in Georgia when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I I don't think I know much, so maybe you could tell me what your for example, what your, what your parents were like? Uh, well, my, my, I'm estranged from my dad and have been since I was, uh, last time I spoke to him was when I was 19. And that was a very psychologically strange thing. My, my, and our relationship, I should say the rest of my family is my mom and two other, two younger sisters. Um, 
we moved constantly. I was born in Atlanta. I moved a year later and I moved almost every year until I was nine and a half and moved back to Georgia, but lived in Florida in three different places, lived in Connecticut in two places, lived in New York for three places before going back to Georgia. And my dad was the sole reason for that. He was, uh, he's like a con man. He's, he's one of those, uh, he's very narcissistic. He's, there's a lot of Trump qualities to him in that he's, uh, he's not vicious or cruel, but he's insane, you know, psychopathically narcissistic and nothing was ever his fault. He, you know, would uh, quit jobs before they could fire him. He'd get fired or he'd quit right before they were going to fire him, but nothing was ever his fault. He was always the victim, um, insanely irresponsible, clearly was w- one of those people, uh, and, and this is applies to men and women, but who I think had a romantic idea of like, oh, I'm going to, I'll be a father and I'll have kids. It'll be fun. And then had some kids and went, yeah, it's not for me and took off and, um, and left us in in incredible debt in a place that nobody was really comfortable with. My mom's from New York. She's from Westchester. Um, So there, so I had dad, I was Jewish uh, and I grew up in the South and I grew up very poor. And I think it's not even close to, close contest as to what shaped me the most. And that was being poor. I think it, it informs everything about me and my behavior, um, some ways, in, in some positive and some negative, but nothing's been more, nothing shaped me more than growing up poor. Was it being poor, that kind of being poor where you don't feel confident that you'll have necessities, food and place to live and that kind of thing? Yes and no. I mean, it was always like we got evicted a couple times. And um, I think that's one of the probably five hardest things I ever had to deal with was I got picked up at the bus stop by our neighbor, uh, Mr. Peters, and he he picked up my sister, Wendy, and I. And and the bus stop wasn't that far. It wasn't like you had to get picked up. It was, uh, you know, maybe a 15 minute walk, you know, through this apartment complex. And and so that was a little odd. And he basically was up there to, because my mom and dad were dealing what was with what was happening. Uh, he was up there to basically kind of soften the landing, as it were, by the, so that we would understand by the time we drove down there. And they had taken our stuff and they were just throwing it on the sidewalk. You know, we were this is in an apartment complex, and just literally they locked some stuff and they were taking things out of my room. I had a ham radio that wasn't really practical, but I liked the idea of it. And I, for some reason, it was a cool thing. And, you know, they took that because they were going to, you know, take it for, uh, you know, compensation or whatever. And they were just taking things and other stuff they were just throwing out onto the grass and the, the, you know, uh, the sidewalk. And some things were breaking. And it was like, that's my bed. That's my, those are my books just tossed in a, you know, bag. And, you know, that's one of the most heartbreaking things I've, I've, you know, and then my sisters and I had to split up and we had to stay with people, different people in there. And our neighbors were super, super nice. And, you know, people were offering like, well, David can stay with us for a week. And, you know, Wendy could stay down here, you know, and we still had to go to school and they, and, you know, it turns out my dad had lied about paying rent and hadn't paid rent and months and months and months and lied to my mom and all that. Um, so it never, it, we were never like sleeping in the car and I can't say that we went without food for ever for more than a meal. Maybe we, you know, there are plenty of, one year for Hanukkah, I got Slim Jims. I remember that, which was like a practical, it's true. It's true. <laughs> I got Slim Jims. <laughs> that was my, uh, my holiday present. <laughs> um, but you know, my, it didn't take too long, no, no more than a couple years for my mom to slowly build credit. And she started with, I think she started with a gasoline card. She got like a, a, a shell credit card or something and then paid that off for a few months, you know, and then never missed a payment and then got a, I believe a Sears card, a, a Sears credit card type thing. And then, you know, would buy X amount of purchases per month, pay it off, made sure she did that. And she eventually got credit and it, it, and that changed a lot of things for us too. Cause she's very, she's very responsible with money. 
I'm sorry to laugh at the at the Slim Jims for Hanukkah. No, it's true. I I, I mean I know that it's I I know what response it gets. I, I'm you know uh, uh, professional comedian. <laughs> But it, yeah, there's, there was, um, you know, it wasn't great. I imagined them coming to you directly from the the Ultimate Warrior or whoever was the. No, this is pro pre. Uh, this is pre. Um, ma- ma- uh, macho wait, ran- Macho Man Randy Savage. Ma- macho, That's who yeah. it was. Yeah. It was pre. Macho Man. Pre- pre- macho Man. Yeah. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> There is like, I mean, you laugh at it, but you know, you laughed a couple times telling those stories. I remember once uh, in therapy, my therapist saying, you know, you're always smiling when you say the most painful things that have happened in your life. And she says, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know if this is something I'm supposed to tell you as a professional therapist, but therapists call that incongruous affect. I get it. Yeah. I guess it's a way of, of managing that kind of thing. Yes, uh, that's but totally you must have been particularly good at it, given your, given your career and the success that you've had. You know, I yeah, I mean, I I suppose so, and I think as hard as it as it was, you know, always being the new kid for a long time and having to pack up and and you know, no sense of stability, um, and you know, here's a new school with new people, and you know, trying to suss out as quickly as you can. Do I want to sit here? Do I want to sit there? Like that guy or that girl, or what am I going to do? And who's going to pick on me and who's going to like me. And, uh, you know, part of it is not being so glum and dour and, and, uh, and just being able to try to let it, let it slide and, and not let it pull you down too much. We'll finish up with David Cross in just a minute. Mr. Show with Bob and David, the sketch series that he created with Bob Odenkirk, premiered 25 years ago. 25. We'll talk about the show after the break. It's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. This message comes from NPR's sponsor, Headspace. Life can be stressful, but 2020 has challenged even the most difficult times of life. You need stress relief that goes beyond quick fixes. That's Headspace. Headspace is your daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in an easy to use app. Overwhelmed? Headspace has a three minute SOS meditation for you. Go to headspace.com slash bullseye for a free month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. Since the 1980s, hip hop and America's prisons have grown side by side. And we're gonna investigate this connection to see how it lifts us up and holds us down. Hip hop is talking about what we live, trying to live the American dream, failing at the American dream. I'm Sydney Madden. I'm Rodney Carmichael. Listen now to the Louder Than a Riot podcast from NPR Music. Where we trace the collision of rhyme and punishment in America. Hey friends, Jesse here, the founder of Maximum Fun, and I have some really great news to share with you. This year has brought a lot of changes for all of us. And one tradition that we were grateful to be able to hold on to is our annual pin sale to benefit charity. This year, through your generosity and love of pins, you helped raise $95,400 for Give Directly. If you're a member and you bought pins, they'll ship in January. In the meantime, your support will provide direct cash relief to families impacted by COVID-19 across the United States. Even in this incredibly tough year, the Max Fund community remains extraordinarily kind. And whether or not you bought pins, you can continue to help by heading to givedirectly.org. And as always, thank you. Welcome back to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. If you're just joining us, I'm talking with David Cross. David is a comedian. He co-created the sketch series Mr. Show with Bob and David, along with Bob Odenkirk. He's acted on TV shows like Arrested Development and The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. These days, he's starring in a new movie, a drama. The Dark Divide tells the story of a science writer and butterfly expert who spent six weeks hiking through the forest in Washington state. It's available to rent or buy digitally now. Let's get back into our conversation. It seems like you had a pretty clear idea of getting out of Dodge, even if you didn't have 
necessarily a clear idea of of exactly what that would entail in the you know medium to long term but you kind of finished high school and moved to New York yeah um well i i the day i believe it was the day after i graduated i went to new york for the summer and um really it was about 4 months and i did stand up a couple times at catch a rising star where you know i would just wait in line all day to get a spot and you know get on at 12:50 a.m. and and then moved back to georgia and i i was there just to to save up money to go to school and um i had a applied to NYU and Emerson College in Boston. I knew I wanted to go to New York or Boston, um, but uh, I knew for sure that I was getting out of Atlanta. That was extremely important. And I, my first choice was New York, but I was happy to go to Boston as well. And, you know, things worked out, so can't complain. I mean, I think even just st- standing in line all day to get, five minutes at catch a rising star at 1250 in the morning is a big deal when you're 17 or 18 years old. That's certainly more than I was capable of at the time. Yeah. And, and I had no money. I, I remember, uh, and I almost got in a fight with a guy too. I remember, uh, I, I was staying at my grandmom's where my mom grew up in white plains, New York. And I took the train in, uh, we take a bus to the number four woodlawn subway I would take a bus to the subway and then take the four all the way in. And then um, you go and you wait until they, I think they drew names or something like that. I can't remember how it worked, but you signed up and there were a bunch of people. And I remember almost getting in a fight with a guy, something about cutting in line or some. And then, and then you wait around, then you wait, you have to come back to find out if you're going to perform. And that's like at six, I want to say. And then, then you just have to wait until you're up. And, um, you know, it's not like you have free drinks or anything like that. And I, I think I had about 10 bucks. So I got a calzone and, and, uh, ate like a third of it and then lugged it around with me all day. Like if I (laughs) went to like the library and I I lugged around this calzone that had some of it for dinner and then I had some of it for a midnight snack and then, um, and then did my set and, you know, whatever, I don't even know. I don't even know if the train ran back then at night or certainly a bus. I don't know. But, um, yeah, the the worst part was just waiting around. I mean, granted, you're in Manhattan, so it was cool. But uh, but it's not like you had any money for anything. But just walking around and, yeah. But, I mean, even, even then you knew enough to know that, uh, that that was what you wanted. That's yeah. Pretty- and, uh, but also, also, uh, let's not uh, gloss over the fact that I wasn't very funny. I wasn't good. I had not developed anything. I had, my voice was, I didn't have any kind of comedy style. It was all over the place. It wasn't anything, it wasn't anything, you know, like this, like, I know I can sing, damn it. You know, it was none of that. Um, so, yeah. At the time that you were doing stand up comedy in Boston, probably one of the most legendary stand-up comedy scenes anywhere oh, at, it's in, the, in the history of Just crazy. stand-up comedy. It's, cra- it's crazy to think about. Also, I think interestingly, like still the stand-up boom of the, you know, of the 1980s kind of continuing along. And so it was a, it, it was a legendary stand-up comedy scene that had many, many, many kinds of voices from the most. Oh yeah you know, uh, big shoulder sport coat with the sleeves rolled up, Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, you and Janine Garofalo inventing what was, you know, alternative comedy five or 10 years later. Well, I, I will give all the credit. Contributing to to the invention of, I won't ask you to take credit for that. Janine is really, she was, uh, responsible for more of that than people I think really know. I mean, she really, she really changed it. And she, she was successful, you know, like there were plenty of people, myself and others that were kind, you know, shared the same kind of thing that, that were doing it, but weren't quite as successful for quite a while. And Janine was helpful in making myself and those other people successful. You know, she was a, absolutely a pioneer for sure. 
The thing that made your career, at least for me and fellow comedy nerds outside of LA, Boston, and New York was Mr. Show with Bob and David, the HBO sketch series that you co-created with Bob Odenkirk. Yeah. You know, that show was a show that ratings wise or whatever, whatever HBO uses to determine success, uh, got by for a few years, but you know, it was long before people were looking to cable television for the most part for, you know, for great TV shows. It was just sort of a, it was a sort of late night secret for people who knew about it. Mm -hmm. It was just the 25th anniversary of the show. Yeah, I saw that. I didn't know that. Until I saw on uh, Twitter, there was a, somebody posted that. That's, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> and and you and uh, almost everybody involved in the original show uh, on the creative side did a series with Netflix a couple of years ago called With Bob and David that was a sort of reprise of the show. And I wonder between those two things, you know, if you've had opportunity to reflect on that time in your life, like if if any of your feelings about it have have changed. Um, I um, they. I don't think they've changed. They be, they become more solidified. And uh, actually, this uh, about I don't know eight, nine, ten months ago, um, Bob is uh, it currently. Um, I think he's done. Actually, hopefully, it'll be out soon. But he's written a book, uh, a memoir, and you know said, "Hey, I'm going to be coming to you with uh, some help and questions, and want to talk to you about the you know the Mister Show, Run Ronnie Run chapters." And I was like, "Yeah, of course." And um, up until then, um, I hadn't really thought about stuff outside of just kind of, you know, doing interviews like this occasionally, or um, you know, maybe when we were promoting with Bob and David. But uh, it it did give myself and uh, the two of us an opportunity to really reflect and and have a conversation about it, which uh, we hadn't really had, and you know, it was it was very interesting, and I'll be. I'm curious to see what what comes out in his book uh, based on our conversations. And, you know, Bob and I are, are very, very close, very good friends, still, you know, remain close. And w one of the craziest things, his daughter, uh, I remember when she was born, his daughter uh, now babysits my daughter occasionally. She's, <laughs> she's down the street, she goes to Pratt. And that's just mind blowing to me that, like his daughter, like there's Aaron sitting in my kitchen, hanging out with my daughter. It's the craziest. That that's that's a that's a real, hey, I'm old signifier more than whatever a kind of random. Oh, it's the 20th anniversary. It's the 25th anniversary, and you go, oh wow. But looking at that, looking at Bob's daughter, you know, hanging out, babysitting my daughter is really something. But um. I'm still as proud of it as I ever was. Uh, occasionally, I'll uh, somebody will put a link to a sketch that you can't really see it. It's be at a, on a Twitter thing. It'll be like, "Hey, that reminds me of this Mr. Show sketch," and then you know, I'll click on it, and it's something I haven't seen since we did commentary for the DVDs, whatever, however long ago that was. And I'll watch it and I'll go, "That's a good sketch." I like that. That's smart. It's got a beginning, a middle, and end. I didn't. I didn't see that coming. And uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm proud of it. Do you feel like? I'm trying to think of of how to phrase it. But do you feel like uh, secure, comfortable in what I guess you would call your my golden years? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say your legacy, but I don't want to suggest that that you don't have uh, that you haven't been doing wonderful work and don't have wonderful work ahead of you for decades. Oh, Jesse, when I look back at what I <laughs> What I mean about it is like do you still feel like do you do you feel like you need to be feisty and defend your territory or do you feel like man, I've I really accomplished some stuff and uh you know, I'm in a I'm in a spot where I can I can look forward to um a kind of artistic security. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I feel uh, the latter more than the former. I feel like I'm, I'm happy with the, you know, I can point to a shelf with my stuff that I've done and go, yeah. I mean, 
Oh, that, that's pretty good. What, well, that thing's not very good. But th- most of this is good. Yeah, this is, I'm happy with that. And, uh, and I am happy with it. And I'm happy with the people I've been able to collaborate with. And I've been happy to have so many of the opportunities I've been given. And I, I guess I'm at a place now where, uh, not that somebody's just going to automatically green light some pitch, regardless of what it is, but I will, people will give me the time and you know, perhaps millions of dollars to make an idea that I thought of. And, uh, and that's a good place to be in your career. You know, that at least I'll get the time and the respect and to sit down and pitch my idea and people will, you know, seriously consider it. And that's, uh, that's pretty much, you know, mostly what I could hope for. Well, David, I sure appreciate you uh, sharing this time with me and uh, making time for it. Absolutely. My pleasure. And I thank you for all your wonderful work over these decades. It means a lot to me. Well, thank you. And uh, it's, it's nice to hear. And, um, you know, hopefully a couple of years down the line, there'll be something else worthwhile to promote and remember. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll do it again. David Cross. His new movie, The Dark Divide, is available to buy or rent on a bunch of platforms, Amazon, Apple, Google, etc., And if you need a comedy chaser, David also released a stand-up album this year. It's called Oh, Come On. And if you haven't seen Mr. Show, well, you should definitely watch Mr. Show. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is created from the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California, where... It was briefly colder, so I went and got my sweaters from the garage. Then it was 92 degrees outside. The show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio and Jordan Cowling are our associate producers. We get help from Casey O'Brien and Kristen Bennett. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. Our theme song is by The Go Team. Thanks very much to them and to their label Memphis Industries for sharing it with us. If you want to hear the latest about what we're up to, you can keep up with the show on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We post all of our interviews there. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.